Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers, and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 364 of our pharmacotherapy series, which majors in acid-base disorders. The first case reads, J.I.D., a 21-year-old, 75-kilogram woman, is hospitalized for evaluation of weakness. She has a history of bipolar affective disorder, pica, and reports recent ingestion of paint from the walls of her house. JID's only current medication is lithium carbonate 300 mg three times a day. On admission, she appears weak and apathetic and complains of anorexia. Laboratory tests reveal the following. Serum sodium levels of 143 milli equivalents per liter. Potassium levels of 3 milli equivalents per liter. Chloride levels of 121 milli equivalents per liter. Albumin of 4.4 grams per deciliter. A pH of 7.28. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 26 millimeters of mercury bicarbonate of 12 milli equivalents per liter a urine ph of 5.5 jid's urine ph after an ammonium chloride dosed at 0.1 gram per kilogram iv load is less than 5.1 a bicarbonate load of 1 milli equivalents per kilogram infused intravenously iv for one hour induces bicarbonaturia that is a urinary ph 7.0 and lowers the serum potassium to 2.0 milli equivalents per liter her blood ph only increased to 7.31 so my question to you is what type of acid base disorder is present Using a stepwise approach, we see that JID's history gives a clue to the cause for her acidosis. The low pH is consistent with a metabolic acidosis because her carbon dioxide and bicarbonate are both reduced. Alterations in pH resulting from a primary change in serum bicarbonate are metabolic acid-base disorders. Specifically, Metabolic acidosis is associated with a decrease in serum bicarbonate and decreased pH, whereas metabolic alkalosis is associated with an increase in serum bicarbonate and increased pH. In respiratory disorders, the primary change occurs in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. If JID had a decrease in pH and increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide, a respiratory acidosis would be present. Because JID has a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide and decreased serum bicarbonate, she has a metabolic acidosis. In most cases of metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, the lungs compensate for the primary change in serum bicarbonate concentration by increasing or decreasing ventilation. 
Most stepwise approaches would next suggest the evaluation of whether the decrease in partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 14 mm of mercury for JID is consistent with respiratory compensation. A primary decrease in the serum bicarbonate to a level of 12 milli equivalents per liter should result in a compensatory decrease in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide concentration by 12 to 14 millimeters of mercury. JID's partial pressure of carbon dioxide has fallen by 14 millimeters of mercury. Normal, 40 millimeters of mercury. Current, 26 millimeters of mercury confirming that normal respiratory compensation has occurred. When values for partial pressure of carbon dioxide or serum bicarbonate fall outside of normal compensatory ranges, either a mixed acid-base disorder, inadequate extent of compensation, or inadequate time for compensation should be suspected. Nomograms, especially ones that are different for acute and chronic disorders, are inherently difficult to memorize, however, and are often not available to the clinician at the point of care. Following the stepwise approach, advocated herein will enable clinicians to identify most clinically important disorders without needing to depend on tables or formulas. My next question to you reads, what are potential causes of metabolic acidosis in JID? Steps 4 to 7 of the stepwise approach in the evaluation of acid-base disorders are used to further determine the cause of the disorder. In patients with metabolic acidosis, calculation of the anion gap serves as a first step in classifying the metabolic acidosis and provides additional information about conditions that might be responsible. JID's calculated anion gap is 10 milli equivalents per liter. Thus, JID has hypochloremic metabolic acidosis with a normal anion gap. Normal anion gap metabolic acidosis usually is caused by gastrointestinal loss of bicarbonate, through diarrhea, fistulous disease, and ureteral diversions, exogenous sources of chloride, e.g. normal saline infusions, or altered excretion of hydrogen ions, renal tubular acidosis. JID reports a history of both, pica resulting in paint ingestion, perhaps lead-based paint, and chronic use of lithium. Both lead and lithium have been associated with the development of renal tubular acidosis. The next question reads, how do the results of ammonium chloride and sodium bicarbonate loading help identify the type of renal tubular acidosis in JID? Renal tubular acidosis, abbreviated as RTA, is characterized by defective secretion of hydrogen ion in the renal tubule with essentially normal GFR. Many medical conditions and chemical substances have been associated with renal tubular acidosis. The recognized forms are type 1, that is distal, type 2, that is proximal, and type 4, that is distal, hypoaldosterone. Type 1 renal tubular acidosis is caused by a defect in the distal tubule's ability to acidify the urine. The most common causes in adults are autoimmune disorders, toluene sniffing in recreational drug users, and marked volume depletion. Type 2 renal tubular acidosis is caused by altered urinary bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule as can occur with the use of acetazolamide. Type 4 is characterized by hypoaldosteronism and impaired ammoniogenesis. Evaluation of bicarbonate reabsorption during bicarbonate loading and of response to acid loading by infusion of ammonium chloride is useful in distinguishing among the various types of renal tubular acidosis. In healthy subjects, approximately 10% to 15% of the filtered bicarbonate escapes reabsorption in the proximal tubule, 
but it is reabsorbed in more distal segments of the nephron. Urine bicarbonate excretion is therefore negligibly small, and urine pH is maintained between 5.5 and 6.5. Type 2 renal tubular acidosis is associated with a decrease in proximal tubular bicarbonate reabsorption. The distal tubular cells partially compensate for this defect by increasing bicarbonate reabsorption, but urinary bicarbonate excretion still is increased. As occurred with AB, serum bicarbonate concentration in patients with type 2 renal tubular acidosis may acutely fall below a threshold of 15, but then stabilize around 15 milliequivalents per liter. At this point, Distal bicarbonate delivery no longer is excessive, allowing the distal nephron to acidify the urine appropriately and excrete acid in the form of titratable ammonia and phosphate. In type 1 renal tubular acidosis, a defect in net hydrogen ion secretion results from a back diffusion of hydrogen ions from the tubule lumen to the tubule cell. Patients with type 1 renal tubular acidosis cannot reduce their urine pH below 5.5 even when systemic acidosis is severe. JID's response to the acid, ammonium chloride load demonstrates an ability to acidify the urine, i.e., pH less than 5.1, which helps rule out type 1 renal tubular acidosis. During bicarbonate loading in patients with type 2 renal tubular acidosis, serum bicarbonate concentration is increased, and abnormally large amounts of bicarbonate are again delivered to the distal tubule. Its hydrogen secretory processes are overwhelmed, resulting in bicarbonaturia. Administration of bicarbonate to JID produced bicarbonaturia and an elevation in urine pH of 7.0, with low blood pH, of 7.31. These findings indicate that the reabsorption of bicarbonate in the proximal tubule is impaired, which is characteristic of type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Type 4 renal tubular acidosis is unlikely given her initial serum potassium of 3.0 milli equivalents per liter. The next question reads, what is the cause of JID's proximal renal tubular acidosis? The most likely cause of JID's proximal renal tubular acidosis is her exposure to presumably lead-based paint. The pathogenesis of lead-induced type 2 renal tubular acidosis is unclear. Some studies suggest that carbonic anhydrase deficiency in the proximal tubule is the major factor, but these data are inconclusive. The next question reads, why is JID hyperkalemic? Bicarbonate wasting in proximal renal tubular acidosis is associated with sodium loss, extracellular fluid reduction, and activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. Aldosterone increases distal tubular sodium reabsorption and greatly augments potassium and hydrogen ion secretion. This results in potassium wasting, which explains JID's hyperkalemia. When plasma bicarbonate achieves steady state, less bicarbonate reaches the distal tubule, and the stimulus for aldosterone release is removed. Therefore, JID experiences only a mild depletion of potassium body stores. When JID is exposed to bicarbonate loading, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis is reactivated, and hyperkalemia worsens. In addition, Raising the concentration of bicarbonate in the blood drives potassium intercellularly and contributes to her hyperkalemia. The next question reads, what treatment is indicated for JID?
Although it is rare for patients with type 2 renal tubular acidosis to develop severe acidosis and potassium depletion chronically, it is not uncommon in an acute situation such as this. JID has a bicarbonate deficit. Thus, she should be treated with alkali replacement, and the offending agent, if confirmed to be lead, should be removed concurrently. Her serum potassium is also dangerously low, and bicarbonate correction could further decrease it. JID needs potassium supplementation. The clinician should obtain hourly blood samples for electrolytes until her potassium is greater than 3.5 milli equivalents per liter. In adults such as JID, chronic treatment often is not needed because acidosis is self-limited. JID, however, should be treated with sodium bicarbonate until proximal renal tubular acidosis resolves. Very large doses of bicarbonate, that is 6 to 10 milli equivalents per kilogram per day, would be required to increase serum bicarbonate to the normal range. In adults with proximal renal tubular acidosis, however, the goal is to increase serum bicarbonate to no more than 18 milli equivalents per liter. Bicarbonate can be provided as sodium bicarbonate tablets, that is 8 milli equivalents, corresponding to a 600 mg tablet, or Scholl solution. Scholl solution, USP, contains 334 mg citric acid and 500 mg sodium citrate per 5 ml. Sodium citrate is metabolized to sodium bicarbonate in the liver. Scholl solution provides 1 milli equivalents of sodium and 1 milli equivalents of bicarbonate per milliliter of solution. Therapy for JID should be initiated with 1 milli equivalents per kilogram per day. The clinician should monitor JID's lithium levels while she is receiving alkali therapy. Sodium ingestion might increase renal lithium excretion and exacerbate her bipolar disorder. Because of severe hyperkalemia resulting from alkali administration, supplemental potassium as chloride, bicarbonate, acetate, or citrate salts also should be administered. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 365.